sermon text is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 22. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 22. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Then the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go. Gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egyptians to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to them, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not, will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us now by your holy word? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Many of you know, or at least some of you know, that in a former life of mine, uh, when I first graduated from college, I worked as a bank teller for a little over a year. Uh, I learned a lot about money, about counting money, about detecting counterfeit money, (laughs) about safety and security, proper procedure, and more. Uh, And if any of you have ever done that work before, you know there's a little bit more to a bank teller than meets the eye. And yet every year at our bank, every single employee from the lowliest bank teller all the way to the CEO had to perform mandatory safety and security trainings, how to detect fraud, how to keep your passwords safe, how to keep money safe. Admittedly, this was not the most exciting thing to do. 
we ha but we had to go back to the basics. And, and it actually turns out that whenever you have to relearn those basics every year, you, it turns out there's always one or two things maybe that you had forgotten, you know, that you realize, oh man, I should be doing this to be better at the security portion. Or you actually carry a couple of experiences to that training, which when you heard it the first time, you thought, I'm never going to use this in my life. Well, but then it's happened, and you know that how important it is to follow that. It's good to go back to the basics. Sometimes with our faith, it's helpful to go back to the basics. Uh, it's there that we realize that many of the, the things that we do and that we assume that we just think are normal practice for everybody, right? You come in, you start, you know, talking about God with me, that those are not assumptions that everybody holds. And in fact, you need to go back to the basics to establish a common ground. I remember there was a time about eight years ago at our church in Jackson, Tennessee, I was leading a small group. We met at homes during the week, and uh, this was a Wednesday night. And there was a church visitor there uh, who was attending, and the what we would do in our small groups is we would just discuss whatever the sermon was about that Sunday. And so that we were, we were actually going through our church covenant at the time and had talked about prayer. And so our discussion was going to be about prayer. And if you were to talk about prayer in your Sunday school class, you probably would talk about the similar things that we talked about. How, you know, how do we make sure we have enough time to do this? What are, we, what are the things that we're praying for? What are the burdens that we each share? What are the barriers to prayer in our life? How can we overcome those? But this visitor who was with us, who'd only been to our church, like I said, once or twice, she didn't really have a sense that she needed to be afraid to ask this question when she said, what is prayer? How do you do that? I mean, to us, that seemed as basic of a question of what is food and how do you eat it? I mean, that's just what we had done all the time. But it demonstrated to us that we couldn't just take those things for granted, but rather we needed to help Others learn. And so, you know, we benefited from going back to our assumptions and realizing what we're doing when we're praying, right? Prayer is communication with God. We come to him and with thanksgiving and confessions of our sin. We bring our petitions to him, believing that he will act in a way that is in accordance with his will, in a way that's best for us. How do we pray? Well, we, simply we do it by talking to God in the name of Jesus, his son. Now that can be speaking out loud. It can be doing it silently when you're praying in your head. It can be alone. It can be in a group of people. It can be in the morning. It can be in the evening. We can pray at any time. This, again, it was a, it was a realization for me that I, I, I needed to constantly be around people who were at different levels of discipleship in their walk with the Lord. Right? It really benefited me from having to examine that and to explain that to this visitor. And, um, and I think it encouraged her. Our passage today, again, it reminds us of the need to go back to the basics. As we consider our faith, even our faith in Jesus Christ, we remember that to, to understand who we are in Jesus Christ, to understand what he did, and indeed, what the gospel is and what it accomplishes, part of going back to the basics is understanding that Exodus is the basics. Right? We don't understand Jesus unless we understand the Exodus. But also, it, we ask in this passage some of the most foundational questions that any human being can ever ask, which is this. Who is God and how can we know him? Who is God and how can we know him? I think if you were to ask your unreligious, your unreligious neighbor that question, they would probably resonate with it too. And so we ask ourselves this morning, and, and again, there are a few places in the entire Bible that are better to answer these foundational questions than in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. And here's what I hope that we'll see today as we go through the text. Since God has granted us knowledge of who he is in Christ, the only appropriate response is an enduring faith which participates in God's redeeming mission. Let me say that one more time. Since God has granted to us knowledge of who he is in Christ, the only appropriate response is an enduring faith, which participates in God's redeeming mission. Well, the first question we want to ask in our passage today is, how can we know God? How can we know God? How would you answer that question today? If you were talking with someone about the faith and they asked you, how can we know God? How can we be assured of this? 
All right, you might pull out your Sunday school answer, which is a good one. You might say, well, in the Bible, go to God's word. But even more foundational, what is the Bible? How is God using that to reveal himself to us? Well, in our passage, we get a glimpse of how God reveals himself. Uh, to create a word, there is a Godwardness. A Godwardness. It's directed to God, even at the very beginning of our passage. Remember last week, we, where we finished off, Moses had just fled to Midian and had been welcomed into that people group. And God heard the cries of the people of Israel. Well, we're back in Midian now. And we're told that Moses is uh, shepherding the flock of his father-in-law in verse 1. And it says, he led his flock to the west side, or maybe a translation would say to the far side of the wilderness, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's a very interesting description to give a mountain, that it is God's mountain. Again, that's a very Godward description. Heretofore in the Bible, Moses hasn't really revealed to us, at least, any particular interest in God, right? He I have no doubt that he was a religious person, but we have no example of him interacting with Yahweh, the God of, the, of Abraham. Uh, just, we just know that God has been very kind to Moses. But here, uh, Moses comes to the God's mountain, and the first thing we notice is that God takes initiative in communicating to Moses. God takes initiative in communicating to Moses. We're not expecting it, but in verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Now, the angel of the Lord here is probably not like this, you know, little baby, you know, naked baby with, a, you know, wings or something. It's not a, you know, a, a humanoid person. It's, it's, it, the word angel in the Bible, anywhere you read it, it literally means messenger. And this, particularly in Genesis and Exodus, we read about the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. And it seems to be to us a revelation of God whenever he is interacting with his people. And so you'll hear the angel of the Lord came to Abraham. And then it starts saying, and then the Lord said to Abraham, all these things. Here, the angel of the Lord speaks to Moses. And the bush is burning, but it's not consumed. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I just am trying to imagine the scene, you know, imagine being at a campfire and, you know, normally fire needs oxygen and fuel to keep going on indefinitely. And here the fuel is perpetually there. It's not burning up at all. And on this mountain, this strange fire keeps burning. And so Moses naturally investigates. And in verse four, the Lord says to Abraham, it says, when the Lord saw that he, that is Moses, turned aside to see God called his name out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, if you ever hear God utter your name one time, you need to pay attention. If he utters it two times, you really got to pay attention. He says in verse 5, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said this, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. God does several things here. I want us to note that God reveals himself in both an auditory and a visual way to Moses. At first, he sanctifies the space. You know, whenever he says this place is holy ground, he's saying this is a place that I'm setting apart for my purposes. All right? It is not uncommon at all. Whenever people have a direct encounter with God in the Bible, they hide their face. Elijah, whenever he goes to Mount Horeb, he hides his face. Whenever the temple is consecrated in 1 Kings chapter 8, there is a bright light and the people can't even approach the temple because of the holiness of God there. And God, again, he reveals himself in a fire. Fire has an interesting quality in that it is simultaneously frightening and attractive. You, you see the light, you see the heat, and you want to walk towards it, right? And ask any Boy Scout or any child. You know, they see a fire and they just want to go see it. But when you get too close, you realize that it's a very dangerous thing. God's presence, who he is, it's the same way for us. It is some, his holiness is attractive. It draws us in, but at the same time, we realize how unworthy we are. It's like Isaiah chapter 6. Whenever he sees God in his throne room, he's immediately aware of his sin. And so God reveals himself in the fire, but he also speaks. And that's what I really want us to focus on. God speaks to Moses. He reveals himself. He tells Moses that he is the God of his father, Amran, who we read about in Exodus chapter 6, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God made an audible noise. 
There are some people who think that it's really impossible for our finite selves to have an encounter with the infinite God. But whenever God chooses to communicate himself to us, we can know him. So how do we know who God is? How can we know God? Is it sim- it's, not, it's not simply because we just intuit who it is in ourselves, right? I, I have a sense that God is this way, therefore he must be that way. Or it's not because we can just, you know, reason in our mind, right? Just can- continue to peel back the, you know, the layers in our mind of uh, what would, a, if, if a perfect being existed, what would that perfect being be like? No, we know who God is because he has revealed himself to us. He has spoken by the prophets. He has spoken in his word to us so that we can know God. So how do we know God? Because he reveals himself to us. Well, having revealed himself to us, then what should we do? What should Moses do? God has spoken to him. What difference does it make? And I think this is important because there are a lot of people who have A, they've gone to church and that hasn't changed their life. And there are even people who call themselves Christians, who grew up in church, who've read their Bible, they've gone to vacation Bible school, maybe they even got married in a church, but it still doesn't really seem to make a big difference in their life. So what should we do about this? Well, God, look at what God says to Moses in verse 7. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cries because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Remember last week as we finished Exodus chapter 2, whenever the people's cries rise up to God's, it says that God, he hears their cries. He remembers his covenant with Abraham. He, um, He sees their affliction and he knows. But we're not told what he knows. Here he says, I know their suffering. God knows exactly what his people are going through. Right, it's quite amazing that God would decide to look at our suffering and even enter into it with us. And I think here of the way in which God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to become a human for our sake. The only begotten son of God, whom Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, he was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew our grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces... He was despised and we esteemed him not. Another way we know who God is is because he revealed himself in Jesus, his only begotten son. He takes our sufferings into himself. And God tells, so he's, he's reaffirming his commitment to his people. And he says in verse 8 that he has come down in order to bring Israel up from Egypt. Out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and and honey, and the land occupied by these six people groups whom God is going to remove so that his people can have the land. God is remembering his promise that he gave to Abraham. In Genesis 15, we looked at it last week, it's whenever uh, Abraham believes God and it's reckoned under him as righteousness. Remember, God told Moses, your descendants are going to go live in Egypt for 400 years, and then, and they'll be oppressed by that nation, but nevertheless, I will bring them up. And one of the reasons he cites for that in Genesis 15 is because the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. The sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. We don't know exactly what that sin is other than idolatry. But they've been given time to repent and they haven't turned from their sins. And so God is going to give this land to his covenant people. And again, the question we're asking is what should Moses do? Well, he should respond to God and God calls him. Look at verse 10. Moses, this 80-year-old man, I want you to think about who he is. He's an 80-year-old man. His most significant act so far in the Bible is he murdered an Egyptian man in cold blood and premeditation. He seems very little in touch with that Israelite identity that he has. Remember, he was raised in an Egyptian household. But God calls him. And there's a pattern in Scripture that we see whenever God calls people, particularly leaders, The first thing that God does is he commissions them. Look at verse 10. He says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh and that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. After God commissions, there's often an objection. Verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Isn't it interesting how quickly Moses' here I am became, wait, who am I? 
And oftentimes, whenever we're called to do something uh, for God, we, we often demur, right? Sometimes we don't feel like we're equipped or competent or that we have the right skills. Sometimes, if we're honest, we might just be selfish and, and lazy. But we, we try to rationalize why we shouldn't do this. I'm not equipped. I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not quick-witted enough. I'm not rich enough to do this. I don't belong. But it doesn't matter what objections we have. God provides reassurance. And that's the third part. So first, commission. Second, objection. Third, reassurance. Look at verse 12. But God says to Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you. I don't know what could be a more comforting promise than that God would pledge himself to us. God is assuring Moses of a few things. First off, he's, not, he's assuring him that he will not simply get an easy retirement. Okay, Moses, remember, he's an 80-year-old man. You're not going to get an easy retirement. In fact, the call of God means that Moses will have to enter into the suffering, the disappointment, and the failures of his people. And these are all but guaranteed. But regardless of how tough the going gets, God has pledged himself. Remember, one of the names of Jesus that we love and we say all the time around Christmas, we should say it all year long, is God, Jesus Christ, his son, is Emmanuel. That is God with us. So God pledges himself to us. And finally, after the reassurance, God gives a sign. He gives a sign. Verse 12, he, prom- he says, This shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When you've brought the people out of e- e- Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You're going to come back here, Moses. Right, if hearing the divine vo- voice from the burning bush wasn't enough, God gives M- Moses proof. And I do want us to be, understand that Moses' call, is, it's not an ordinary call. He was called to be a prophet. And that didn't simply mean that he was God's megaphone to the people. It meant that he was called to lead them. Again, to enter into their trial. Right, um, you know, uh, one time I heard uh, someone who was a high-profile uh, prosecutor for the government say that, you know, the, the attorneys that don't want to take on cases because they don't want to have a loss on their record, so they just try to steer clear of all, anything that could failure. He said, those are in the loser's club, right? No, you're, you're going to take on cases, you're going to lose. Sometimes we don't want to be, we don't want to lose, and so we don't get in. But God calls his people to do this. And God, simultaneously, he has placed a call, upon, after, upon hearing the revelation of God, he's placed a call upon our lives The first call is that we would respond in faith, that we would trust him. That's exactly what Moses needed to do, to trust God's word. And then the particular call is the next piece, and that depends on each of us in our own situation, right? Maybe you can get out of the house during the week, and you have the health and strength and means to go help and bless other people. Maybe God is calling you to do that, and and, and maybe you're like, but I don't have that. My health isn't as good. I don't have as dependable of transportation, how, how am I to get out and around? If, how am I to follow God's call? God's calling you in a unique way. And our role is to obey and to trust that whatever God's calling us to do, he will provide for us. Remember, Moses was 80. I know some of you haven't hit that yet. <laughs> some of you have, but not everyone. Right? God is calling you to follow him and to trust him. So we've talked about how one can know God. He reveals himself to us. What should we do? We should answer the call. But the big question that still looms and that we have to answer is, who is this God? Who is this God? It's an important question. And again, I I feel like I kind of grew up in a world where I understood there were other religions out there, but I mainly had two options. I could believe in God revealed in Jesus Christ, or I could just not believe in anything at all. Right? And those two options are still before us. Those are still maybe the main options that we encounter and our people encounter. When I say our people, I mean our family, our neighbors. But there are other religions. There always have been. Okay, We don't exist in a vacuum where those are the only two. Right? Why do we worship the father of Jesus and not the god of Muhammad? Right? Why don't we concede that the Hindu gods of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, why don't we just dispense with God and depend upon our own reason. Well, it matters who this God is. In Exodus 3, again, it's one of the most important passages in the Bible where God reveals himself to us. 
Moses has objections for days. We see a couple here in this chapter. We're going to read on next week. We're going to see many more. He says in verse 13, If I come to the people and they say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Remember, he's an outsider, even among his own people. He's not lived with them. He was raised with the Egyptians. So what credibility does he have? Well, God gives him that credibility in verses 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Or, we can maybe translate that, I will be who I will be. He said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I'm to be remembered throughout all generations. Again, if you're ever reading your Bibles, right, and you notice that there's, a, you ever see the word Lord in all caps, that is the way in which our translators have decided to translate the word Yahweh, which is the name of God. So here, whenever it says, tell them that the Lord has sent you, he's telling them, actually, tell them that Yahweh has sent you. And this is a proper name for God, right? The word God is used by basically all peoples and all places to refer to divine beings. But here, Yahweh is the proper name of Israel's God. He is distinct and unique. So, you know, the Egyptians had a pantheon of gods, Osiris, Isis, Ra, Aten. No, your God is Yahweh, Yahweh who is the only true God. But also, whenever God tells us his name, he's implying a relationship. Right? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of your fathers. He's the God who makes covenant with people. He enters in with them. He allows them to participate in his own life. And this implies also a vulnerability. Right? By giving his name to Moses and allowing the people of Israel to be called by his name, God opens him up, his, himself up to libel, to slander, to mockery. He entrusts himself to a people who won't necessarily entrust themselves back. But it also describes God's glory. Right? It is the God who determines who he is. There's no one else who gets to tell God what it means to be God. Only God gets to do that, for he is the sovereign creator. That this God alone is worthy of our praise. And it's the God who is revealed in Jesus. I mentioned earlier that Jesus in the Gospel of John, whenever he's describing himself to the people, we get this, you know, uh, we could really trace this thing through the whole Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we learn that the word of God was with the Father in creation, and then we have this amazing verse in chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This Yahweh was revealed in the person of Jesus, his Son. And whenever Jesus would go through his ministry... In the Gospel of John, he keeps on using this phrase, I am. Nine times he uses this to describe himself. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Before Abraham was, I am. This is who Jesus is. And so in Revelation chapter 1, whenever John is taken up into heaven and God is revealing himself to him, he gets this amazing vision of God. And we're told that this is, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. It describes God's eternity. And it's the name that God has and that he shares with his people Israel it was always the case that Israel was never the sole possessor of this name. But rather, it belongs to all peoples, because God is the God of all peoples. It's not like knowing this name gave them any magical superpowers or supernatural skills. But rather, it was for the benefit of other people. Jesus comes, we read this earlier in John chapter 10. I'm come to get my own sheep. I have some sheep that are not yet of my fold. I must go get them. We read earlier at the beginning of our worship service, 
Psalm 96. I'm going to read the first four verses of that again. And every time you see the Lord in this, it's not bolded on our screen, but just know that it is bolded in the translation. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord, sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing to the Yahweh all the earth, sing to Yahweh, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory where? Among the nations. Declare his marvelous work to, among all the peoples. For great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. As we think about these questions, how can we know God? What should we do about it? And who is the true God? Who is this God? Again, we can't answer these at all without Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Right? How do we know God? Because he became a human for our sake. He went around teaching. And thankfully, we have four accounts of what he did on earth for our salvation. Who is this God? It is God revealed in the persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What should we do? We should respond in faith with this enduring trust. I'd go back to what I mentioned earlier. Since God has granted us knowledge of who he is in Christ, the only appropriate response is an enduring faith which participates in his redeeming mission. It's a faith that Moses and the people of Israel would need. I don't think that, you know, sometimes I face relatively small challenges and I feel like it's hard for me to have faith in the middle of those challenges. Moses had to go lead a people that had hundreds of thousands of people there. He had to go talk to the leader of another nation and say, oh yeah, I need you to let all your slaves go. How did that work when it, you know, whenever we tried to do that in America? It was not a good, uh, it didn't turn out well. Now, the oppressors don't like it when you tell them they have to free their enslaved persons. How much faith would it take to lead the people through the wilderness without food, without water, to go back to that mountain. But nevertheless, it is faith indeed. And in, this is what we're called to do. We live, again, 3,500 years after the, God appeared to Moses on that mountain in the bush. And we have a greater revelation in Jesus Christ. We live now with the power of the Holy Spirit within us who's given us new life and empowers us to meet our neighbors. So we go forward in faith, participating in the mission of God. And so today, as I come to a close, I just want to say a few things. First, if you don't know who God is, if you would like to pray, maybe you're joining us online, I'd love to talk with you about that. I'm going to be standing down front in just a moment, and I'd like to talk to anyone who would like to know, talk about how can they know God and have a relationship with Him. If you're online, feel free to send us a message. We'll reach out, we'll, we'll get back with you. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, what is God calling me to do? I believe that God is real. I believe that he sent his son Jesus for, my, for the forgiveness of my sins. But what am I to do now? If you want to explore that call, I'd love to pray with you about that. And finally, if you're interested in joining here, maybe God is calling you here to join up with us in the mission of the church here, to partner with this fellowship of believers. I'd love to talk with you about that as well and what that can mean looking forward for us. But if you, if you would, please bow your heads with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and we do praise you, and we thank you that you uh, spoke to Moses on that mountain so many years ago. Father, we know that Moses was not one who came to you qualified for the work set before him. It wasn't work that he had prepared to do. It wasn't work that he sought out. But Father, you called him. You equipped him. You went with him. And Father, I know that as we move forward as a congregation together, as we not only gather week by week for the worship of your name, but as we endeavor to be your people of God on mission with you, Father, that we need the same trust. Father, as the world changes, it can seem that we need to reinvent the wheel. We need to, you know, figure out a new way to do everything. And Father, we want to if we need to change things, we want to do that in faith, but also to trust that the power of your word, the power of the gospel still stands today, that there is still no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. Father, that uh, all those who believe are saved and are forgiven of their sins. 
So, Father, I pray that you would help us to exercise that faith. Would you help us to come alongside those who don't already know you or who are seeking but who are looking for answers? Father, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.